Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Simon Froude, and I'm the Director General of National Archives of Australia. I would like to welcome you all to National Archives here in Canberra for this year's UNESCO Memory of the World Symposium. I'm delighted to see you all here on site and also those who are joining virtually as well, so thank you. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we meet on and acknowledge and pay my respect to their continuing culture and the contribution they make to their life of this city and this region, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We were hoping to have Auntie Tina Brown, uh, a Ngunnawal elder, uh, provide a welcome to country, but unfortunately Auntie Tina has been unable to make it today, so my acknowledgement of country and the traditional owners will need to suffice. I'm so pleased that the National Archives has been able to support this UNESCO Memory of the World Symposium. Um, the symposium's topic of honouring stories of struggle, reassessing Australian records of disadvantage, is something that is relevant to so many in our community today. And the topic raises thought-provoking questions around the role of archives and collections in ensuring that evidence and memories are recorded and made accessible for future generations. It also makes us consider the supporting role that archives play in advocating for the disadvantaged in our community. As you know, the decisions of Australian government affect the, the daily lives of millions of citizens, residents and visitors to our na nation. And reflecting on our collection, you can see evidence of the past government actions that have affected many in our community. For example, we hold documents that show support for migration post-World War II, records relating to the evacuation of the community after Cyclone Tracy hit Darwin, and evidence of policy decisions that led to the forcible removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families. By preserving and making these records accessible, we can support land right claims, restitution, family history, transparency and accountability. Similar topics were explored earlier this week at the Australian Society of Archivists Conference, which I'm sure many of you would have attended and participated in. I know many of you will be feeling energised and inspired by the speakers' discussions and workshops held earlier this week, and so I'm delighted that we can conclude the week of knowledge sharing here at National Archives for this event. I'm very much looking forward to hearing such a diverse range of speakers today and listening to all of the discussion that that generates. I'd now like to hand over to the Chair of the, today's proceedings, Dr Rosalind Russell, from the UNESCO Australian Memory of the World Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director General, for your welcoming rem remarks. And uh, first of all, I would very much like to thank the National Archives of Australia and the Australian Society of Archivists for their generous support of this program and, uh, and ongoing as they have supported as in the past. This year's Documenting Australian Society event forms part of the worldwide activities to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the UNESCO Memory of the World program. The theme of this program is enlisting documentary heritage to promote inclusive, just and peaceful societies. And the theme responds to the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, particularly its Sustainable Development Goal 16, which seeks to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all and build effective, accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels. And they go down to the next level, which is targets. Target 1610 is to ensure public access to information and protect fundamental freedoms in accordance with national legislation and international agreements. So our symposium today thus aligns very strongly with the theme of the 30th anniversary of the Memory of the World program, of which, of course, it is a part. So today we'll be considering the following questions in two sessions. Uh, session one will consider what evidence of disadvantage should be preserved. And session two asks what evidence is being preserved. In this, this first session, we'll look at the following questions. Is the lived experience of Australians who experience disadvantage adequately recorded in our national, state and community collections? What evidence and memories of these Australians should be recorded? And what say should Australians, what is, what is, what, pardon me, when it is preserved for the present benefit of future and current generations, how should access to these resources be managed? 
and what say should Australians who experience disadvantage have over the information that is created and preserved about them and how it is accessed? So we'll, our, our four speakers will address these questions in the, over the next um, hour or so. Uh, for those people online, uh, you can start asking questions of our speakers at any time, uh, but you need to go to the right-hand side of your screen and access the Q&A button where you can enter your question, and we'll be dealing with the questions at the close of the session. So I'd like to hand over now to our first speaker, who I believe is online. Um, that is Frank, Frank Golding, uh, who is Honorary Research Fellow for, at Federation University Australia, where he has completed a PhD entitled Care Leavers, Recovering Voice and Agency Through Counter Narrative. He is a life member of CLAN, the National Care Lever Advocacy Body, and Frank is a social historian who has written more than half a dozen books and published numerous articles and book chapters. We look very much look forward to uh, Frank's contribution on our topic today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Rosalind. <clears throat> I hope we can get the technology to work. Um, and, and I, also to the audience members, I can't see you, but I'm sure you're all you're all there and uh, expecting uh, a cracker of a of a program today. And hello to my fellow um, panelists. I must say I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say, rather more than listening to myself. Um, so I have a power presentation which I hope will work. Um, I need to share the screen, don't I? Okay, um, I want to start by giving a, snop, a snapshot of uh, my childhood in out-of-home care because I think it actually raises and typifies some of the issues we want to discuss today. Well, when my father en enlisted in the army in 1940, he dumped me and my brothers at the Children's Depot in Melbourne uh, as a drunken act of punishment uh, against our mother. And when he failed to pay his uh, agreed maintenance for four successive weeks, um, we were committed as wards of the state of Victoria. The law required that we be charged with the offence of being neglected. I was two years old. My two brothers and I then bounced around among three foster mothers back to the Royal uh, uh, Park Depot at, um, and the Andrew Kerr Memorial Home in Mornington and finally a long stay in the Ballarat Orphanage. Our parents had a volatile relationship, but when they finally settled down, and they did certainly when our father gave up the grog and the war was finished, they begged the department for the return of their boys, but that was refused time and time again until we were old enough to go to work. Now, this is a typical story of fragmented families. Thousands of parents seeking the return of their institutionalised children were refused on the grounds that they were not suitable or adequate parents. And countless children were separated from their brothers and sisters in the out-of-home care system. Many of them never saw their parents again. I was lucky uh, to be with my two older brothers for most of my time in care but I was deeply distressed by the bewildering separation from my parents, which no one ever explained to me. Not once in all those years, from the age of two to 15, did any social worker or carer ever sit me down and explain to me why I was in an orphanage when I had perfectly good parents and, and, and who told us they were trying to get us out of there. And I lived with that uh, perplexity for decades. Mine is just one of countless stories of an Australian childhood. Some 500,000 children were in care in Australia in that period, 1930 to 1980. In that time, there were more than 2,000 institutions, orphanages, uh, children's homes, family group homes, missions and reserves, youth detention centres, other res residential out-of-home care facilities, as well as foster care providers. I want to stress that this is not just an historical issue, while the era of large institutions is over, there are record numbers of children in care in contemporary Australia. Some 46,000 children will not sleep in their family home tonight. And disgracefully, a hugely disproportionate number of these are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. 
And while we talk glibly about lived experience as if it's all in the past, thousands of children left the care system carrying great damage, which they're living with still. It's difficult to overestimate the, uh, the enduring impact of being dislocated from family to be raised by strangers on the grounds that it's in the child's best interests, only to file, find the child was worse off than before. The 2004 Senate inquiry accurately reported, and quote, the litany of emotional, physical and sexual abuse, often criminal, assault, neglect, humiliation and deprivation of food, education and health care, end of quote. The scars of that ultimate betrayal don't, hurt, don't heal easily. And I said, many children who were dislocated from their families never knew why they were not living with them. So many children had to live with that perplexity as, as, uh, as children. For decades, well into their mature adulthood, they hungered to understand what happened to them and why it happened in the way that it did. So as adults, care leavers have learnt that records were made about them. We didn't know that, in fact, until quite late in life. And that under FOI legislation, we have entitlements to access them. Care leavers who know about the legislation, and not all do, approach agencies that hold these records expecting to find the answers to the many questions they have made uh, through their journey of self-discovery, many to authenticate their childhood memories, uh, to reunite with fragmented families, if that's still possible. Some care leavers also look to the records trying to find, to find justice in the form of prosecution of offenders civil litigation against institutions and other forms of redress. It's an understatement to say that gaining access to records has not been easy for care leavers. Many homes have long since closed. Some organisations that ran them are no longer in existence. Children were shunted around multiple institutions and foster homes and records did not track them. Many care leavers are heartbroken to learn that their files can't be found. Some have been lost or destroyed, deliberately or otherwise. Some children have been wards of the state and others were not, and it makes a difference to what was recorded and archived. Some non-government organisations still don't feel that FOI legislations apply to the records they hold. Many care leavers also disillusioned by finding incorrect dates, misspelt names, large gaps in their life story when nothing was recorded, and, a, and shallowness. Some expect to see basic information like family medical history, school reports or a birth certificate, but are profoundly disappointed that such information was never recorded in many cases. One care leaver told the Senate inquiry, I get two sheets of paper with about nine or 12 lines in it. I look at these two sheets and I'm devastated. 18 years of my life on two pages of paper. Others have found their files run to hundreds of pages, but struggled to make sense of them. Redactions in files cause a great deal of restress, distress. Names and identifying details of other people mentioned in care leavers' files were and still are censored, even when the third party is a close relative. Information about my parents and brothers, for example, was censored even when it was critical to understanding my situation. Rare photographs, uh, highly valued by care leavers, have been released with faces blurred or, or heads cut off in a crude attempt to protect the privacy of third parties, taking no account of the emotional impact this would have on the single person whose face has been allowed to be seen in the photograph. Many care leavers are angry with what they find, insulting and defamatory comments and hurtful gossip about themselves and their parents. Above all, they're resentful that their personal files are so negative. The child and their parents are problems, always constructed as problems. There's nothing about personal achievements or anything about the, the way the children uh, grew. These personal stories then don't uh, tell us much about the child's experience of growing up in care. For a start, records were written for other adults, never intended to be read by the adult the child would become. The voice of the child, the voice of the parents were never heard. Nevertheless, 
I argue that personal file, case files are important documents that must be preserved, along with the administrative records, correspondence, uh, superintendent's diaries, punishment books, minutes of meetings, and so on. In many cases, they're the only means care leavers have to piece to, or to begin to piece together a lost childhood. The, Inst uh, the National Find and Connect web resource serves as an important role in identifying where these records are, in most cases, who controls them and who to contact to get access to them. But they re the records themselves remain scattered in a diverse, disjointed hybrid system. There have been inquiries and commissions at the national level, and most states have also held their own inquiries into aspects of the care system in their jurisdictions. There's a torrent of personal testimony and submissions to these inquiries. I calculate some 5,400 individual survivors have presented to these four national inquiries. And this body of evidence serves to make experiences known and generates a collective history that challenges the one-sided and often self-congratulatory histories produced by government departments and agencies. That body of testimonies must be preserved and made more accessible. Sorry, go back one. Beyond this uh, bank of formal testimony, care leaver advocates and activists have been generating what amounts to a counter history of outer home care. I mentioned just some components of this emerging body of work. There's oral history and published memoirs and other personal accounts challenging the dominant story found in official accounts of child welfare. In 2010 to 12, with extra Commonwealth funding, the National Library of Australia uh, conducted professional oral interviews with care leavers, including child migrants. That was a one-off project led superbly by Joanna Sassoon, but it's finished. At that time also, the National Library reported that it held about 70 published memoirs written by care leavers. Yet we know there are many, many more than that. Hundreds of care leavers have produced oral history and written memoirs and personal accounts. These burgeoning care leaver narratives are found in diverse places such as the clan newsletter and clan website. Many are self-published and targeted at family members and other care leavers. Others, an increasing number, are aimed at the general public and find commercial publishers. Clans Library has an extensive catalogue, far exceeding that of the National Library. This body of work can be likened to a new form of history from below. Personal histories created from memory of direct experience and often residual fragments of family anecdotes. This work must be encouraged, but the question remains about how it might be best preserved. Many care leavers, for example, are not even aware of their legal obligations to deposit copies of their publications in the national and state libraries. So they're not found there. Historians, it said, and rightly so, sometimes rely too heavily on written documents. Moreover, the written word too often excludes and disenfranchises many care leavers who through no fault of their own did not complete basic schooling though they had the intelligence and the desire to do so. It's not surprising then to find many turning to non-literary creative forms of expression as a way of, uh, of uh, responding to childhood memories and the ever-present trauma of childhood abuse. For example, as a response to the Royal Commission on Child Sexual Abuse, Clan President Robin ha Robert House curated a wonderful exhibition at the Ballarat Regional Art Gallery in May to August of 2021. And Clan's been encouraging these creative endeavours for some years and is accumulating a collection at the Australian Orphanage Museum, which I want to tell you about right now. In 2004, the Senate Forgotten Australians report recommended the National Museum of Australia establish an exhibition, preferably permanent, it said related to the history and experiences of children in institutional care with a capacity to tour the nation. Well, it took seven years for the museum to mount a small scale exhibition uh, in Canberra uh, called Inside, irony not intended. It toured three states and then vanished. 
plan has always considered that if anyone is going to memorialise the past the way it should be done, it should be care leavers themselves. It's been collecting artefacts and memorabilia for over 20 years. In 2017, the chair of the Royal Commission, Justice Peter McClellan, visited Clan's temporary museum and, co and commented thus, quote, it's a very significant Australian memorial and I hope you're able to keep it and maybe develop it in the years to come because it marks out for you a very significant story in Australia's history. In 2019, Clan gained a Commonwealth grant to enable it to acquire a property in Geelong as a permanent home for an Australian orphanage museum. It should have been the historic Geelong Protestant orphanage that you can see in the picture there, but the grant funding didn't allow it. The museum is ready to open with a permanent exhibition and a special exhibition mapped out already, but there are further requirements imposed by the Geelong City Council that have to be met and further funding is required before it can open. The special exhibition that I mentioned is called Talking Back to Records, results from a project undertaken by CLAN with a grant from Public Records Office in Victoria and the professional support of historians Kate O'Neill, Abby Belfarge and Michaela Hart. This is a project that gives care leavers an opportunity to respond to what they find in their childhood records a kind of right of reply. And I'm not at liberty to quote from the findings just yet, but I'm confident they'll make salutary reading for anyone who works in record making today. The final area I want to mention quickly is that what's become, is what's become of the sites of the former orphanages and children's homes. Many of them have been demolished already, uh, others like the Geelong Orphanage, the one I mentioned just now, and my alma mater, the Ballarat Orphanage, have been sold off to private uh, profit-making developers. Some remain in the hands of the agencies that ran them, but now serve as aged care uh, facilities, much to, the, uh, uh, much to the concern of those who grew up them as children. Former residents, care leavers and, and, and others have fought long and hard to have a say in how their childhood homes should be conserved. And two contrasting examples, uh, just briefly mentioned, Ballarat and uh, Parramatta. In the case of Ballarat, the large two-storey building that you see on the left there was demolished in 1965 and the remainder was subdivided and sold variously uh, to a private school, residential developers, a childcare business and a supermarket chain. Despite all that, a number of former residents have never given up the hope of salvaging something. Former residents have collaborated with authorities to design and install a series of created memorials, winding a pathway through a prominent uh, section of the property. That work is, is not yet complete, but um, very uh, positive about it, its, its uh, outcome. By contrast, the Parramatta Memory Project at the long neglected site of Parramatta Girls Home in Western Sydney began in 2012, uh, working towards the preservation of those significant uh, historic buildings. The site was added to the National Heritage List in 2017 and uh, World Heritage Listing is a distinct possibility. This recent book that I've shown there shows how the art and activism of former residents can change places and perceptions of people in history. So in summary, here's what I think should be kept uh, for generations uh, as representing the history of care leavers. The personal files and administrative records, the testimony that I talked about, the memoirs, oral histories and creative artefacts that um, care leavers are making the historic artefacts and memorabilia being collected and the way in which they're interpreted and the heritage sites. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Frank, for that incredibly moving and also incredibly comprehensive coverage of the topic we're looking at today. Um, I found your phrase, bewildering separation, just a stunning um, evocation of what it must be to be in that situation. 
And I'm sure that everyone else would have had a similar experience in listening to what you had to say. Um, thank you very much. And we'll have questions later on, of course, um, from uh, both our in-house audience and our online uh, viewers. Um, moving on to the next presentation, it's from Robin Sutherland, who is the Executive Manager at Community Services for Uniting Communities. With more than 30 years' experience in the social services sector, Robin has experience in working with young people and their families in the areas of child protection, family reunification, child sexual abuse, alcohol and other drug addictions, and homelessness. Over the last few years, Robin has had a focus on service design and innovation and self-organisation and self-management to challenge people's perspective on how they are able to work together. So over to Robin Sutherland. Thank you. Hello, my name is Robin Sutherland and I'm the Executive Manager of Community Services at Uniting Communities. Uniting Communities is a large, not-for-profit, uh, non-government, a community welfare organisation that provides services to many thousands of people um, across South Australia. When I was first asked to present at this seminar, it took me a while to actually get my head around how um, I would have any use, anything useful to say um, at this seminar. I, I thought about archiving in a, a very generalist sense. As I went away and thought about it, I, I suddenly realised that our organisation's been around for nearly 115 years and in fact for 115 years what we've been doing is collecting people's stories um, and archiving their information. I then had to put to myself actually, were we actually honouring the story of people, the, the the, the information that they give to us. Um, like most organisations, we collect a lot of information. It meets the criteria of the Privacy Act. It has to meet legislation. Um, it meets what the government bodies that fund us require of us. It has to meet the requirements of how we want to use information in the organisation. And as I thought about that, I suddenly realised that in fact, for most people that come to our organisation, that in fact, they, they, they're usually um, very marginalised. And sometimes for those people, it might be a one-off interaction we never see them again, but predominantly for most people, organisations such as us or government agencies have been collecting their information and archiving it all their lives, sometimes for the lives of their family members and their parents. And that in fact, the information that we gather is incredibly negative and only shows the story of those people while they're interacting with us. It, uh, in fact, doesn't honour who they are the 90% of time that they're not interacting with us or have anything to do with us. I then thought that it was really important that I went out and started talking to people and asking them what they understood about the information that was being collected about them and what that said about them and whether they would have an interest, in fact, of telling their full story about who they are. At the same time then I started that process by looking at our data. How, how many requests do we get for people wanting to access their files? And um, I looked at a period of time of 12 months, um, it was through COVID so it probably was a lot less, but we had 200 requests for files to be accessed and that information to be looked at. and. 85% of those requests were coming from government, from child protection, and it was very much looking for information probably to have children removed. Whether that was right or wrong, it was that snippet. Only 13 people actually asked to access their file to just out of interest to find out what was being collected about them. I was quite shocked and then the more that I then started asking people did they understand what was being collected about them, many people didn't. Um, and what they said is because 
when we were explaining the process that we went through was usually when they were in the heart of crisis. I then talked to staff as well to find out then what is the info, how much do we collect the whole story? And in fact, most of the information that we collect is about trauma, sadness, crisis, hurt. Um, very little is collected about people when things are going well, because usually when things are going well, they leave us and we stop collecting it. Now, I know the theme of the seminar is about collecting people's stories more than just who we assume people want to collect stories on, that it is, it is about collecting those stories of people who are marginalised. And following that path then, I thought what would be most useful for the seminar is you actually hear from the voices of people who are marginalised. I went to two different groups um, and the, I went to those two groups, which are people that interact with the child protection system and those people that come through our drug and alcohol services. Because what I know about them is that they've probably had people collecting information about them all of their lives. And I, I thought what would be more useful is hearing for, from them, hearing their stories. Um, and as I spoke to people and, and as you will see as this goes on and you hear these stories, people wanted to talk about the moment, what was going on for them now, what had gone on for them uh, while they were interacting with services like ours. And I, I wanted to try and pull people away from that and talk about, do you want to share your whole story? But I think the thing that we do have to think about is for the many marginalised people, they have had people collecting their stories for a really long time. It has had a negative connotation. They kept talking about it's, it's the negativeness. It's not who I am. So I couldn't pull that away. It, it was so important for people to talk about what that meant for them. And then once they talked about that process, they, that there was this real passion for wanting people to know the full story. But we actually never ask people what information do they want us to collect about them. Um, when they go, we don't actually ask them, what else do you want to tell us about yourself? And that, that's a really interesting question that we need to be really thinking about that in, in the process of, of the way that we collect information. And so, in fact, here are a few snippets of the interviews that we've conducted. And I wonder what questions it'll have you asking yourself about uh, what do, how do we collect information, how do we collect the stories, and what do we want to do with them? So no amount of data could uh, tell my story. What you'd have on the paper wouldn't, wouldn't reflect anything of, of what I've done in my life. The collection of information I don't feel um, tells the whole story of who I am. Sometimes it's you'll mention something and it gets focused on in the wrong way, or like a, maybe it's more it looks more important on paper than it actually is in my life. And I guess unfortunately, a majority of the data that has been collected in regards to myself, um, it's negative. I really do think it's important for me to share my whole story. My story is about overcoming adversity. I'd like to think there was some nice things said about me, unless it's just from the initial interview. And if it's from the initial interview, I don't even remember doing it because I was inactive active addiction at that point in time and I was probably drunk so yeah um, just depends on when when and where they were taking that information and whether they they keep taking notes as you improve during the program or how it works I'm not 100% sure. I, I don't know where where my data is I don't I don't even know completely what is collected um, I don't know who wants to use it I don't know who can use my data. I actually have folders full of um, education results and um, and accomplishments and achievements in my life that nobody would look at. People have been collecting information for probably the last 10 years. So over the past year there's been a lot of um, information collected about me and my family. There's been <laughs> ClinSight, DCP, Nupin, um, New Roads, uh, Metropolitan Youth Health, um, legal commissions. I have no idea um, about the data that's collected on me or who it's shared with, where it goes. I just know I've been asked a lot of questions in the past year. 
Well, I think people have been collecting data and information about me since the day I was born. Um, yeah, I guess the minute I came out of the womb, or maybe when I was still in the womb, actually. So um, all of that is still on record. When I've gone to get help, that's the records that everybody's got that, that, that come out and were used against me in a bad way, a really bad way, and used against my children. And my children were split up in different houses all over the place. And <sighs> Well, the current information that they have on me um, makes me look like, you know, I, I was, it's just about drug and alcohol and, and problems with substance and this and that, but I've achieved a lot more than that in my life and, you know, obviously that's not recorded. Moving on, I mean, I'm a completely different person to what I was two years ago, you know, I'm just not that person anymore. And um, it is hard because it's all the information that's going to be held on me is all based on the negatives and um, of extreme parts in my life when I was in a terrible place, you know, so they're always going to be over my head. And um, yeah, it's hard to, I'd really like a nice clean slate now, you know, it, in some aspects of things, but I'd also like to, like my stories can be useful as well, you know, but, but not necessarily uh, as defining who I am now um, because um, I'm not that person anymore. Going over all the information that has been collected about me, um, some of the times that it's affected me negatively getting a job didn't really represent me and who I am properly. Um, the data that was collected, it, it showed a bad light on me um, without looking at me as a person and who I am. It was just looking at one event, one time where I might have made a mistake and that stopped me or could have stopped me from getting employment. Well, my understanding of the collection, of the information that's been collected about me now is different to what it was when, when it was collected. I, um, I didn't understand it until it was used against me in court, and in these courts. And then when, it, when they'd collected all the information from all the services that I'd used over the years and presented to me and presented to the courts, I couldn't believe that that's the, the picture that was, collect, was collated of me. That, that was, that's how I was perceived by the courts. I had lots of files at home and um, references from employers and, um, and really good stuff, but none of that was looked at. The stuff that was looked at was stuff from different services that I'd gone into when I was in a real hard way, bad way, needed food for my family or needed housing or things were going bad. And I'd gone into these different services looking for help. And um, I had to present myself as a bad, as, as in a bad way. So when, the, when I went to the youth courts, there was all this paperwork saying that I was, I was constantly in a bad way. And it wasn't accurate. It wasn't, it wasn't an accurate portrayal of my life. Nobody's asked me about the things that I've wanted to say. They've all demanded that I answer the questions that they want to hear. I think stories about people like myself would be very important to collect and, and the whole picture, you know, not, not just those negative events, the whole entire thing. Oh, I, th I think there'd be great value in like hearing my story and what I've been through. Yeah, I think that's a point in recording my story. Yeah, if somebody was to ask me about my story, they should literally just ask me, well, how do you see yourself? Who I am now, I'm, I'm a mum, a stay-at-home mum um, who also works as a disability support worker or in the aged care sector. I am a good person. I, I try to be a good person. I very much so. I, I've learned from my mistakes. I want my, my children to see me being a good person. I want hopefully for them to learn from my mistakes. Um, if I was asked to share my story, um, I'd probably be interested in that. Um, I suppose the, for me, the um, comeback's always bigger than the setback. Every time I've fallen, I've gotten up and achieved a lot more than I had. So, um, and especially this time around in my recovery um, journey, my comeback has been full of positives that would be wonderful to share and could help a lot of other um, struggling addicts out there. Who would benefit from hearing my story? I, uh, I just, I, I believe the, whoever's in charge of the youth courts would really use, <laughs> use some help like in structuring their, their system a bit better. They, they need to really listen to the people that are, that are in the system. But they, and then 
not think because they've got university educations that they're somehow high and mighty and <laughs> superior and, and, and brush off people that are that maybe um, criticising their actions. We're not criticising their actions. We want to be heard. We want them to, to take note of what, what we're saying and to just give options, to make better options. If someone was to record my entire life story um, to get the real picture of who I am today, I would want to share all bits, good, bad, everything, because all of that, it is who I am. That defines me, the good and the bad, the whole picture. If I leave bits out, it's not going to make a lot of sense, is it? As far as uh, sharing my story and adding that to the archives, I'd be absolutely, that would be brilliant to do. I mean, um, as far as my journey going forward from this program, um, the jobs that I'm going to be looking at doing is going to be a lot based on my life experience. So I'm going to archive that regardless of whether someone wants me to do it for my archives because I'm going to have that in my resume. That's going to, my life story is going to be part of my resume and all the stuff that I've done and working with Indigenous people and working in drug and alcohol and, and you know, being a chef and, and having apprentices and work, running large teams of people as a manager. All that stuff's going to go into my story. And I'm going to write it whether someone asks me to do it or not. So that's going to be part of me creating my resume to move forward into what I want to do. So. Who am I? All right, so who I am is uh, I'm a nice, caring, uh, good person who just wants to be involved in society and uh, has missed a lot through his life and has made many, many, many mistakes, but um, uh, knows he's made these mistakes and I know that I can be a massive contribution to some something, <laughs> I don't know what, you know, I can be very helpful in whether it's in this organisation or in the art world or I just don't know, but um, I think I've got um, heaps of potential that was definitely muffled by my choices of drugs and shit in life, yeah. And that's who I am. And that's what I wish people knew about me is where I'm sort of headed and what I'm going to be now and not of these terrible times that were in my life where, I mean, Geez, I was sometimes suicidal in my life or, um, you know, had to come to a breaking point before I got to becoming, wanted to become good. But I've never, I've never felt so good about myself in my life and never been as happy as I am now. And um, just my thirst for knowledge and the brains all opening up and everything. And I, you know, I was just uh, uh, dumbed down, you know, for a long time, you know, and, um, Lost had didn't have any confidence, or so I think it had a lot to do with self esteem as well, you know. But um, now I'm just ready to, I'm really, really happy, you know, and um, just ready to take on everything. But um, yeah, I, I definitely think that uh, my information, like I, when I went to court the other day, I was saying um, I had all these letters of uh, character references and that from New Roads and uh, everything else, and uh, the judge actually stopped and commended me on it, you know, which was. Good, but whereas if I hadn't had all those letters and that, my, my history would have been looked terrible, you know? But um, yeah, then he was obviously given that, I gave him that information, so then it was good, yeah. Going through this whole process for me really has me questioning um, the way that we collect information. Now, I know that we do it in the way that meets privacy and uh, meets all the legislative requirements. But I really feel that we're actually missing the most important thing um, about people, which is about their resilience and their whole story, that we're only getting one bit. And so certainly as, uh, what I'm taking away from this is that I think we're really going to um, start to look at the way that we collect information and should we actually at the heart of it, at the, or at least when people are leaving our services, ask them, what else do you want to tell us about yourself? Well, that was really something. And uh, I think most, most people, I'm sure, have been incredibly moved by the, the power of those people's stories and the fact that they felt so strongly about the negativity projected about them 
and their attempts and the attempts of the organisation now to overcome that by proper recording and by properly telling the whole story. Um, we're building up a picture here, definitely negativity is definitely one of the key words that's coming through, as is the whole story. Uh, our next speaker is Eva Cox, um, a name very familiar to many of us um, from many decades ago and uh, still, of course, a um, very powerful voice. She's a writer, feminist, sociologist, social commentator and activist. She has been an active advocate for creating a more civil society. She was a long-term member of the Women's Electoral Lobby, Lobby, well, and is still pursuing feminist change by putting revaluing social contributions and well-being onto political agendas, as well as recognising the common ground between Australia's First Nations and feminist values of the importance of the social. She was appointed as an Officer AO of the Order of Australia in 1995 for her services to women's welfare and was named Humanist of the Year in 1997 by the Council of Australian Humanist Societies. Over to Eva Cox. Thank you. All right, after that, I'm not quite sure where what I was going to be talking about fits in. Can you all hear me? Good. I really was wrote this thing on the basis of what it, my how my childhood and experiences, which are fairly limited and not in the stages that other people are talking about them, led me to be a change agent. <clears throat> and I think that's a very important part of what we're doing. So the notes that I made, which are much more formal, I'm going to skim past to some degree. I'll give you a bit of my background history because I think one of the important things that we need to know is what makes other people pick up the things that we hear. It's lovely having archives, but somebody's got to use them. The people that are in them will be, they'll be used in all sorts of ways, but to some degree, I'm really interested in how do we create a better society than we're living in at the moment, which is pretty grim at the moment. I must say that I'm not exactly pleased about the fact and I'll talk a bit more about that later, that we seem to have decided we live in an economy, not a society, and that we're all busy counting self-interest rather than the social. And I mean, a lot of this stuff is social. And I think we need to get back to the idea that the social is important, that the relationships are important, that values are important, all those things that we can't monetize, that don't get counted in GDP and therefore get ignored, unfortunately, by political parties who think that the economy is the only thing that counts. And that's a very limited view. I'll make my statement here quite clearly of human nature. I don't think we're self-interested digits. We spend most of our time trying to get an advantage for ourselves. We're far too interdependent. We're babies for far too long. We're small children that need care. And you go back through our history. And if you look at the histories of way back yonder, and particularly if we've got the brains to look at the histories of the first people in Australia who have managed through thousands of years to create societies built on the social networks, the beliefs, the sense of who the other people are and the interdependence of people and stories and various other things. We would probably have a very different view of what the future was than the one we seem to be dealing with at the moment. So I'll give you a bit of my background, and that gives you a sense of how I ended up being the curious stirrer that I am. I'm, by the way, not a member of WELL anymore. Haven't been for a long time because they thought I was being far too pushy. So I'm one of these people that gets into trouble for trying to make changes quite often because I think they're important. And why and how? All right, I'll give you two items from my early childhood memories. I mean, the thing is, at, at the age of... 12, 13 months, I think. I was born in Vienna shortly before Hitler marched in. And since my parents were Jewish, that was obviously a bad thing to do. And my father got out by the underground fairly quickly and went to Palestine, as it was then, joined the British Army. And my mother fled with me and pressed to hear nothing else apart from a couple of, I think, gold chains and my nappies to England when I was 13 months old. And so we arrived as refugees at a time that was before the start of the war and we were sent to Cromer, a village at the side there. My mother had been a medical student in her final year, but she didn't actually 
she wasn't able to go anywhere to finish her thing because she'd had a baby and having a baby while being a medical student was not the thing to do in 1938. So she was in England working in fairly low level jobs and varying things and I was there and we went to Cromer initially a sort of uh, nice place and things but then when the war broke out they decided all the potential refugees could be Nazi spies and we might signal the uh, submarine so they sent us all inland and I got put into uh, alternate care after I developed scarlet fever or something of that sort and was returned to my mother when I was three so I had a fairly early experience of standing on my own and one of the things that I think is very significant about this was the fact that my mother was desperately trying to read me English literature to get me to sort of be more acceptable around the English areas and I was read the Rudyard Kipling's Just So Stories. And I developed a very full, strong attachment to the idea of the cat that walked by itself. And I think that stuck with me because I thought, you know, I was going to be the cat that walked by itself. I was going to be subject to no one. And that was at a very early age. I asserted myself at the age of three also, and this is significant to my later history, when I was sent to the uh, kindergarten and they were handing out the uh, instruments for the various sort of music type sessions. And I had my eye on a drum. I desperately wanted a drum. And I said to the teacher, can I have a drum? And she said, no, girls don't have drums. The girls get the cymbals and the tambourines and the boys get the drum. Sorry, the boys get the cymbals and, and the drums and the girls get the tambourines and the triangle. And I think at that particular stage, I became a feminist and decided that nobody was going to tell me what I could have and what I couldn't have on the basis of the fact I was a gender. And at the age of eight, which was just after the war, my father got himself released from the British Army and got himself a job at the UN and in Rome. So I moved from being in spare rooms in England with my mother in reasonably low paid jobs to living in a flat in Rome which had five bedrooms, three bathrooms and a maid. So my sense of class was perpetually destroyed by that. I really knew what the bottom and the top was and became very aware of that. And we came to Australia when I was 10 because my mother's family had actually come out here before the war where I discovered I was another bloody ref though. So I spent most of my early childhood being an outsider but also being an outsider who had a father who was trying to save the world, didn't do a very good job of it, but I won't go into any details of that. But I grew up with the idea that we had a responsibility to do good for, uh, you know, to, to fix things if we found things were wrong. And that certainly became part of the thing that drove me. Now, as a continuing aging activist, I've become really aware of the gaps we've left and those occurring in archives and history. Pre the colonising from 1788, I noted here, the First Nations in control had diverse and complex ways of recording past and present events and making them part of the, their cultures in a way that we had no idea how to do. But some of the, these were not recognised until very recently, and I know the next speaker will be dealing with those things. And we still haven't really learned a lot about it but we are gradually realizing that there was a lot more to it than the stuff that came up from so-called Western civilization, which seems to be the thing that's been playing with games of us since the industrial revolution, when we actually discovered we worked for money and not as part of a social relationship things. But I still actually had those sorts of ideas. Most of us later arrivals only gradually and recently became aware of the pre-colonizing early history and, we, and the destructions of our predecessors were nastily responsible for. The pace and level of support is still biased, shown in the recent debate about the inclusion of these wars that we had with the original inhabitants uh, that were not suitable for inclusion in the Canberra War Memorial because the only colonizers plus immigrant wars overseas were really Australian. And I mean, that's a very good example of how we actually structure the past in a way to exclude. Now I gather they might be actually adding a bit to it, but you know, that we can't actually look at the original wars against the original inhabitants as part of our history. 
is a very sad thing that we need to make sure that the archives do actually cover not only what happened, but how it didn't happen for such a long time, because that becomes really important. I'll give you another incident, which I've got later in the paper, but it sort of seems to fit in here, that reminded me very much of my own history and some of the things that we misjudge. I mean, somebody earlier today mentioned the fact that we had this fantastic immigration program after the war, which I was part of. We arrived in 1948 as refugees of the plain and eventually, you know, sort of settling in Australia. So I thought some years ago, not for a few, only a few years ago, somebody was organising uh, public letter writing things where we got up on stage and read letters to people as to died, thanking them for things they'd done or looking at some things in the past as a way of creating some sense of past things. And I thought, I'll have a look at the post-war immigration program. And I looked up Arthur Caldwell, who was the minister of the time, to find out what they had done about letting in displaced Jews and things like that. And I was horrified to find out in one article, and I don't think it's the sort of thing that gets publicized when we talk about the glories of the post-war immigration program because I've never heard of it before and haven't heard of it since. And I, but I did make a point when I wrote the letter, as I read out, that they only allowed 8,000 Jews per year in because we were not going to be assimilated in the same way as other refugees, because we were not Christians, presumably. And I thought, this is an example of the anti-Semitism that we've been fighting. All right, they were prepared to let some of us in, but making the assumption that we weren't going to fit in gave me a very different view of what that post-war immigration thing did. I can remember also, because I'd lived in Italy for a while and I was aware of it, when they brought out a whole lot of Italian young men, there was a huge backlash against them because it was assumed that they were going to go around raping Australian women. So they promptly brought out some, some Italian women so that they could all get married and not do that. So that was also part of the immigration problem. So it raises for me an interesting question about what is actually recorded in immigration records how much those sorts of potential flaws that we can look at now are actually recorded in there, or how much does the formal government views about what they were doing and why they were doing them end up being what we get in the archives, and we only get the odd bits and other sorts of areas. And I think that's a really important part because actually valorizing something like an immigration program because it was so generous when it did something like that, which made me feel distinctly uncomfortable, is something that we do have to think about with the archives and think about different things that do get overlooked by the archives because the stuff we've had so far about people talking about their individual experiences are absolutely essential for the archives. But we also have to look at whether or not the reports that are made by the government by the policy makers and by, to some degree, historians who actually want to stick within the framework because that way they'll get more grants or whatever it is and be seen as being more Australianly oriented. And it sort of just reminded me also of another small incident that I uh, remember clearly, which is when I was a, a student and just finishing off my sociology course. It was the early days of the uh, Whitlam government. They were putting out amounts of money for particular groups to employ people because there was a lot of unemployment at that stage. And I got a phone call from Sarah Dowse, who was then working for Whitlam, saying, could I think of a job, set of jobs that we could have that would employ migrant women because nobody was doing that and we were bringing in a lot of them. So being a researcher and a sociologist in the making, I said, we'll do a piece of research. So we got some money and we hired a whole lot of people from the various backgrounds of people, the Turks, Italians, Greeks, various other sorts of things, and interviewed the women because nobody actually paid attention to women. Don't forget I'd become a feminist and become involved at that stage in well and various other things. So I said, let's go and interview some migrant women by migrant women, and we did. And one of the things we found out, particularly when we were looking at the interviewing the Mediterranean people, particularly the Mediterranean women, is most of them were illiterate. Nobody knew that. 
And in fact, when we went to talk to the person in the Department of Immigration to say, do you realize that large numbers of the Italian women you're bringing out here are illiterate and the courses you are running in the English language depend on literacy? He said to me, they're not illiterate. We have evidence. I said, what's that? They signed their papers, immigration papers. And I said, well, that's a bit ridiculous. So obviously they could be shown how to write their own signature, but they can't read things. And so they don't go to the courses. So we have a large number of women who have no capacity to get become part of a more Australian society, which was part of the whole reason, because they, are, they don't get out of the house, they don't talk to people, they can't read and write, and they're not going to courses. I think we managed at that particular stage to get some change because we kept hassling them. But I really wondered how we'd managed to get an immigration course at an immigration style. This is 19, what was it, 1973, 74, I think, you know, around those things where we were importing large numbers of migrant women who'd left school after, I learned, the, I think it was a Greek word for tessera because a lot of the Greeks had left school in fourth grade. A, they had a different writing uh, thing, so they couldn't read faster. And B, leaving school at that age meant they were highly unlikely to be literate. And so they were missing out. But they did, and I really do wonder, and haven't actually checked this out, I probably should have before I put it into the speech, whether or not that is anywhere in the archives. Does anybody mention that we made this great mistake and probably hundreds, if not thousands, of women came here who did not learn English because they were illiterate and nobody knew they were. Those are the sorts of things that has made me a political activist. From childhood on, the desire to find out those things that needed to be fixed, to find out the reasons that they needed to be fixed. And to realize that things like a lot of the sort of pro-Australian things, that the heritage of the British Empire is being seen the primary thing. When I first arrived here, immigrants were expected to assimilate. We seem to have lost that language. And it was later under Whitlam initially, and then later on it sort of got picked up where we recognised that we could learn, or that Australians, Anglo-Australians, could learn from people from a foreign background, a different background, that we could integrate their cultures into our cultures. But that was certainly not the thing in the 1940s and even into the 1950s. And now when you look at some of the sorts of things about some of the out-groups and in-groups, we still find that there are breaking up sort of cultures where we haven't been allowed people to feel that their culture is as valued as other people's cultures. And that goes back deeply into our history. And I have not, I'm not a historian, so I can't tell you how much of that was really written up until it was picked up as with the racism and the various other problems. And now we're looking at all of the other sorts of groups of in-groups and out-groups and so on, and gender and a whole lot of other things. Now, of course, one of the other things that I'm really interested in is the gender perspectives. And I really don't know how much of that is actually in the archives. I know there's been a lot of feminist historians who've dug all sorts of things out of them, records and put them into archives because they weren't there, because they weren't seen as important, because it's the males that define what's important. So we've lost information about a lot of early feminists or early women who were trying to make a serious difference. I mean, those people that are going out and finding that stuff but they gaps in it. But there's a more serious question around gender at the moment. And that's one about sort of what happened. And I'm just going to go very briefly back over the sort of post-war thing. That, I mean, the bit of history that I sort of hang on to in the Second World War was Roosevelt meeting with Churchill, I think it was 1941, where they decided post-war, we had to put social issues on the agenda because one of the reasons that it had led the sort of rise of fascism during the 1930s was when things like the depression occurred people lost trust in governments they lost trust in the idea of democracy in a whole lot of relatively new countries took up dictatorships so that's where you got germany italy spain and other sorts of groups where they were looking for somebody they were looking for the idea of uh, hereditary sort of 
things of, of, of having their own leadership because obviously other people weren't going to do that and that's where you get some of the excessive nationalisms and various things that grew up after the war. So after the war we did have an, uh, a move towards a welfare state. If you look at what was done here by the AOP government after the war, have a look in Britain what was doing there, look at some of the new countries and the things that were set up in uh, across Europe and the USA, in a sense, had done it because they, if they'd learned from their New Deal program that one of the ways of dealing with disadvantage was by providing jobs and providing welfare and providing various other things, you know, aged care, child care and various other things, which we did after the war. I was one of the people that worked quite hard on trying to get child care up as a normal service, not as a financial commercial service that's another question i'm not going to go into but you know we we need to actually recognize that the arrival in the 19 late 1970s 80s of neoliberalism and the move to the idea of economics being the driver of social policy has wiped out a lot of the social issues and particularly questions around unpaid work women's skills that's why we've got a gender pay gap and all of those other things so in a sense, the failure to sort of put those things into the history in the early stages has left us with racism, sexism, and various other things by excluding the importance of feelings, of relationships, of ethics, and all of those things which you can't monetize, and they don't get counted in GDP, which I tend to refer to as gross, definitely not domestic, and very often not productive because we do very well out of fires and floods because we've got all the expense of fixing them and that pushes up GDP. So I think that we need to make sure that we actually put together a few a centers of knowledge about our past that covers those things that have been excluded as are necessary to create a good society. We've lost the dreams that we had post-war for a more utopian future. The high level of distrust of democracy at the moment has driven us into a whole lot of, of new dictatorships or verging dictatorships. I mean, we've just had somebody elected in Italy, a woman, would you believe, who shows so certain fascist tendencies and various other things of that sort. We have to recognize that we live in a society, not an economy. Economics may be part of it if you can actually work out which particular part of it you believe in. And so the archives have to reflect some of those tensions and some of those pasts and some of those things we've left out. Certainly from the First Nations stuff, we have a hell of a lot to learn from them. Secondly, on this sort of feminist stuff and the fact that somehow or other women's wages, I can remember finding a an award at one stage where people who park cars in parking stations got paid more than people than women who were taking care of young children nearby. And that's obviously a gendered assumption about what jobs are worth that was not put into things. We've got discussion at the moment about the gender uh, gaps and the gender bias. Putting women only into paid jobs will not fix that. We need a system that looks at unpaid work because the unpaid work has saved us from the floods, from the fires, from the various other things in many cases. And yet I suspect that it's probably not recorded as much in the archives as it could be because it doesn't have a dollar value. And yet if we're going to create a future, we need the archives to explain how the gaps occurred. You need rat bag activists like myself who are prepared to sort of push the system, sometimes harder than other people would like to see it pushed, to say, we're not going to survive unless we take into account different cultures, different races, different pasts, different things that we've left out. Because if we let the government, and all governments will do this to some degree, to use the archives to make sure, yes, you can tell the stories that we've heard in this first part of this thing, and yes, they're dreadful, and yes, they need to be acted on, but who's going to act on them? We need to encourage the archives to cover the mistakes, to cover the errors, like, you know, forgetting to find out whether women were truly literate when they came from rural areas of Europe after the war, to make sure that those sorts of things don't get repeated again and again. 
because otherwise we'll be telling the horror stories that nobody's going to be fixing it. So I'll leave that at that, which I think I've covered my timeline <laughs> by avoiding a lot of things, but by saying that I think it's actually really important that the archives mirror the needs of the population at large, not just those that have the capacity to lodge their things in the archives and clean out the things they'd prefer not to be remembered. So I think that leaves a big thing for the UN and various other things. Yes, we need the outgroups to tell their stories, but we need to put it together so it is useful for activities and usable by ratbags like me who think that we can fix things and think we need a lot more of those in the future that are optimistic about the future because at the moment, the surveys are showing a lack of optimism and a lack of trust, which could be extraordinarily destructive of our futures if we don't fix it. So over to the archives and the rest of us to try and create a sense of optimism, a faith in the fact that human society is not just about self-interest and that we are capable of creating the utopia that seems to have gone off the, or at least attempt to attract get a utopia that seems to have gone off the agenda. We don't use the word these days, but we need to get back to it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eva Cox, for your rallying call for uh, addressing the silences that uh, are still in the archives, even if minimal information is recorded, such as the signatures of illiterate women. That was a very resonant story for me, I must say. And, and also your story about the drum, that was wonderful. Um, what, what makes us a feminist? What makes us an activist? Always an interesting um, story to be heard. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, I'd like to introduce now Professor Noreen Young, who is one of Australia's leading and most respected workplace diversity practitioners and thinkers. She's Professor for Indigenous Policy at the UTS John Bunner Institute for Indigenous Education and Research. Noreen leads John Bunner's highly innovative Indigenous People and Work Research and Practice Hub. The only one of its kind internationally, the hub focuses on robust research and analysis, policy, practice, people and law reform around the workplace experiences of Indigenous people. Over to you, Nareen Young. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. And hi to people in the room that I know, Eva. Hi. Um, so, um, I'm, and I'm really bad at this. Um, Bea Diyu Badyari Daragu Yiyara, Yiyara Nara Biran, um, Bayadu Bedyari Daragu um, Warangan Baranyang Yagu Bari Baribagu Yiyaragu, um, Bedu Badyari Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander, Yigura Nugagara Bimal Wayangu. Um, I speak well of the Darug people, the people belonging to country. I speak well of the old ones, past, present and the future people. I speak well of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people towards country <clears throat> and Mother Earth. I'm a descendant of Eastern or Coastal Darug or what some people have termed Eora. Aboriginal people through the Fowler family with my great grandmother having been born in Redfern and resettled in the Sydney area and specifically Newtown um, where our family has continued to reside. Like others and very, very topically, um, we are observing the work of First Nations historians around unsettled questions of history in the Sydney Basin. We have always said that we are descendants of the Eora, but are now coming to understand that that name and term may not be correct. Um, like many families, as has been um, impacted by past government policies resulting in our lack of knowledge about exactly who we are, who I think people like you will understand. Um, it is what it is, and we believe that we should be transparent about this. I also acknowledge the people and elders past and present of all the countries we're working on today and in the times we 
are in. I acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today and their distinct descendants, their custodianship and management of this land for so long um, for us all to share in the bounty of acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded and the deep grief, trauma and suffering of the last 230 years and resilience and survival as illustrated by what I'm here to discuss today. Many, many thanks to my excellent, excellent, lovely and fabulous colleague, Dr. Kirsten Thorpe, who has shown all of us at Jambana. I think the power of what she does and the deep need for Indigenous people to control our own historical and contemporary narratives and for asking me here today. I will show you that the narrative of Indigenous people and participating in the economy is um, in this modern Australia is in deep need of truth telling. Given current discussion around the possibility of a national truth telling about the past, I'm really struck by the topic today and its current relevance and learnt so much off all of you speakers um, today. Who has, who has the capacity to own the truth, the di different um, perceptions of truth and how that impacts on everyday ordinary lives and how it so deeply impacts on the area I specialise in, the employment participation of Indigenous people in this economy. Hopefully, truth-telling um, that may or may not happen will not be limited to the bits that non-Indigenous Australia views as the important bits, the massacres, the stealing of children, the overt racism. Hopefully it will go to the grinding everyday racism that has made Indigenous people and cultures what we currently are. I'm very luck reluctant to call um, what I do Indigenous employment as the phrase itself speaks to erasure of truth and the development of acceptable, accepted behavioural norms on the terms of ownership of the narrative. Indigenous employment, it always seems to me, speaks of the deficit model of perceived Indigenous existence in the modern Australia. It says that Indigenous employment is unusual, that it's something that needs to be facilitated for Indigenous people, even enforced. It says that it's not the norm. I come from what is termed in this session disadvantage, or we are transparent, honest and say poverty on most sides of my family and from people who aren't Anglo but are white. Most of their histories don't really rate a mention except that on one side we've been the fortunate beneficiaries of the development of labour and working class history as a discipline in the 60s and 70s. And my grandfather, <coughs> sorry, Dutchy Young, who I now recognise as having probably been one of the first culled trade union officials, which of course now in diversity practice terms we aspire to, having been a high profile trade union official um, in Sydney. We have reasonable records of that side of our family um, because of this un uninvited high profile, um, because he was a culled um, progressive trade unionist and because they were white. On my dad's side, um, my great-grandfather, Nut Jungren, was a seafarer from Kalmar in the Midlands of Sweden who jumped ship around the turn of last century. Um, and Eva so interested in um, the um, immigration records issues and um, in your um, revelation about, I suppose, quotas on the number of Jewish people um, allowed to come in, how incredibly typical and how just nauseating in the context. But anywho, um, uh, um, this, of course, was not uncommon for seafarers the planet over, but over the last 20 years or so, um, we, his descendants, have taken great delight in saying we're illegal. He didn't go very far after he got here and lived and worked with his family in Susanna Place in the Rocks where he and my great-grandmother operated a corner store. He also worked as a coal lumper on the waterfront and took part in the 1917 general strike, as did my other great-grandfather, Peter McLaren, who sailed from Glasgow and also lived in the Rocks and indeed Susanna Place with his family, including his daughters, one of whom was my grandmother, Jessie. I understand that both of them subsequently found it hard to get work after that strike as they were notorious 
stripers and eat out a living in other ways. This is where we get lucky um, in the youngs though. In the 80s, there was a working class labour movement activist who was Deputy Premier of New South Wales and insisted that the Sydney Living Museums acquire a row of three terrace houses in the rocks um, that were intact and restore them to become a living memory of the way that working class and of course diverse, which Miller's Point and the Rocks was, was given its proximity to the waterfront, communities lived in Sydney at that time. Susanna Place is now a museum and was restored um, pursuant to my grandparents and other people's <coughs> oral history records. Anyone can now look at how those people lived. Um, now go down and have a look and just have to pay a little thing. Of course, tragically, the living, breathing, diverse working class communities or communities of Millers Point and the Rocks was destroyed by Prue Goward as Housing Minister of New South Wales and enacted by Michael Coots Trotter as Department in the Secretary, uh, Department Secretary in the name of greed and a view that working class People don't belong in the inner city and especially not the harbour front. My grandparents always said that the water was in their blood, coming as immigrants from where their families did and growing up on that magnificent, welcoming Gadigal Harbour. That place is now unrecognisable and I wonder often what Jack Ferguson might think and thank him for his incredible foresight in preserving Susanna Place and note that he actually had control of a part of the narrative at the time. And so it is recorded for posterity that working class diverse Australians lived and worked in the rocks. I know that this doesn't ever seem to include the First Nations, both traditional owners and resettled people who came from other places anywhere in this narrative, who I know, absolutely know, have always um, that known are there and of course have continuing residence and in some cases um, continuing ownership there. My poor grandparents must have been oral, oral history like nobody's business as they also feature in a classic of the working class social realist genre, Weevils in the Flower by Wendy Lowenstein, which is oral history about living through the depression and Unions New South Wales did a significant um, oral history piece with my grandfather. So we're very lucky on the young side of our family, but I note that nowhere in these working class narratives, except as, as you know, you mentioned a bit, um, side characters, even in the socialist realist novels of the 60s, like Bobbin' Up or Down on the Dockside, do we find First Nations people's stories? Did they not identify publicly as First Nations or did they just not figure? Hang on, something's happening with my screen. Am I still, is it still all good? Yep. Um, uh, certainly the understanding that why Indigenous people, that only Indigenous people can tell Indigenous stories would not have permeated at the time. Um, so it can't be that. I'd like to note Ruby Langton's Don't Take Your Love to Town as depicting Abor Aboriginal life and labour, mar labour market participation in the Sydney of the 50s and 60s as one of the first to this. And of, of course, she was a Bunchalung woman. As someone who has, who has worked in work for a long time, I'm aware that the labour movement as a representative of working people has some but not all capacity to control its own narrative when it comes to the history of work in this place and in what employment and its nature is and means in the modern Australia. Indigenous people do not. And in my view, this is closely connected with truth telling and the development and application of government policy and legislative frameworks as they um, now pertain to Indigenous people and work that I have the privilege of working exclusively in. So what is the dominant narrative around First Nations people and workplace participation in the modern Australia? It's Indigenous employment, it's sit-down money, it's bludging blacks, it's welfare, it's blackfellas spend all their dole on grog and smokes, so their money needs to be controlled by a cashless debit card, the brainchild of a mining billionaire who, of course, mines Indigenous land. It's Tony Abbott's Community Development Program, a recommendation of a report 
into Indigenous employment um, conducted by said mining billionaire, of all people, whereby Indigenous people living in remote communities had to work for the dole and not be paid wages or superannuation for work performed. An extraordinary occurrence in a country where, for all its faults, the wages um, and employment system that was established by those people who fled from oppressive regimes in Europe was arguably its best feature. At the best behest of said mining millionaire, some people on the basis of race were placed outside the wages and employment system that uh, pertained to everybody else. Don't believe me? Read the Forest Review, 2014. It's currently on the National Indigenous Australians Agency website. I should note that I was a, at a meeting prior to the Federal Government's Jobs and Skills Summit um, where Minister Burney, Minister for Indigenous Affairs, announced the abolition of that alleged um, employment program and its replacement with a properly remunerated Indigenous Developed Remote Jobs Scheme, just as had been campaigned for by the Australian um, Council of Trade Unions, First Nations Workers Alliance for a decade. Don't tell me that all political parties are the same. So how did we get here where flagrant breaches of actual human rights frameworks were facilitated by the suspension of the Racial Discrimination Act that the Northern Territory intervention enabled that is still suspended, I should add. How are, are we at a place where every election cycle, and I, I know there was a it was quite quiet last time. Indigenous employment is an issue. How are we at a place where intervention has to take place at every level of business, industry and government to either employ First Nations people or to set targets for Indigenous people to be employed and promoted? How is this a thing? How is it a thing? The correct answer is, of course, racism, but it seems to me that in record, reassessing records of disadvantage, the lack of prominent or even at all record of the working lives of First Nations people would be right up there, and the racism of the lack of inaccurate or records of disadvantaged at all, of disadvantage at all, should be named, especially in the context of what it has created here. The lack of records of disadvantage are a key reason that the dominant narrative has become fact and why Indigenous people are so disadvantaged in employment market terms. The truth that we know in our communities is that Indigenous people have always taken part in the economic life of this place since colonisation when and where permitted. From the eastern Darigal Gadigal Fisher people who showed the early colonisers where to fish and therefore eat, and I wish to acknowledge Rowena Welsh Jarrett for um, naming that concept, and in a way were the first practitioners of ecotourism. To a judge I heard about recently who doesn't acknowledge his indigeneity, to captains of industry, to being denied the capacity to work on our own land in the early days of squatting and land clearing, to being resettled on missions and being paid in rations or having wages stolen off said um, own land, to female children being stolen to be trained to work as domestics, um, again, often on their own land or in the cities, in living memory for wealthy women to eking out uh, for wealthy women to eking out a sparse living as fringe dwellers in all of the capital cities to the factories where word of mouth had it were places would, that would employ blacks. Every black family on the eastern sub seaboard has one of these stories. I heard a story undocumented, of course, a few weeks ago that I've never heard before. An Indigenous oral history is a strong and powerful thing, but it doesn't match your expectations of dreaming stories. Indigenous oral history, of course, goes to the last 230 years and to matter of fact stories and of survival and resilience as fringe dwellers in our own place as well. It so often goes to the hidden, undocumented stories on, of survival on the margins in abject disadvantage, um, as it's termed here, that is Indigenous history since colonisation. I won't be long. The story was from a black fellow whose family um, went to a suburb of Newcastle early last century from Sydney in a story that has some 
parallels and matches with records in my own family. Of course, there's a lot of industry in Newcastle and mob gravitated, gravitated there because um, there were places that it was known through what we term um, as the Koori grapevine, which non-Aboriginal Australia has no or little very knowledge or very little knowledge of, um, that would employ Aboriginal people. But there were mob who passed as white in public or outside the home very specifically so that they could work or take part in the economic um, life of the place, despite what the mainstream narrative would have us all, in, 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 including some of us, believe. They said that they were Māori or South Sea Islander only, as many um, in fact were, or Spanish or Irish as my family did. Some applied for the dog tags that meant that they formally relinquished identity so that they could, could work and not have their children removed. In the interests of secret, secrecy and, um, prote and protection, there's very few records of, of those people. The oral history I heard last month said that there was self-determined Aboriginal safe houses run by mob in a suburb of Newcastle, and I'm not going to expose, disclose where, um, to a group of non-Indigenous people out of respect to those mob who were forced into living like this and their descendants who may not even be aware of their history as so many people aren't out of shame and deep oppression where people couldn't escape to, could escape to and hide and fashion a new life and work. This happened, it is truth. Um, only now for white Australian racists to have the temerity to be critical of Indigenous people for re-identifying the same people whose actions and attitudes enforced it in the first place. I was telling a very respected Murray auntie this yarn last week and she said, what do people not understand? There was a war here. Um, uh, sorry, I've lost this. People went into hiding like Jewish people in, in Nazi occupied um, countries, dyeing their hair blonde so they could disappear. So in the hopefully forthcoming period of truth telling, will the stories of the lengths Aboriginal people went to to work, to not have their children removed, to live freely be told, Will Indigenous people be able to tell of this, all of the stories in a public way um, that have contributed to where this place finds itself? Or will the, don the dominant narrative that has been created prevail? I acknowledge Kirsten thought um, earlier. Kirsten took us as jump on a staff, uh, staff to the state archives, which I was pretty traumatised by. I don't know much about epidemiology, but I do know that I had a pretty visceral reaction to the records we saw of domestics being indentured because they were indentured, no matter what Scott Morrison might have said, as they left Cootamundra Girls Home and were sent to Mrs X of Haberfield or Mrs Y of Neutral Bay. Imagine what life um, would have been like for these teenagers, little girls. The same day, we saw records of the request from any member of the school community for Aboriginal children to be removed from schools being played out. That was in New South Wales until the 1970s when I was at school. Any member of a school community could ask for an Aboriginal child or children to be removed from a school. In this particular instance, the request stated that the Aboriginal children were dirty, but to the principal's absolute and eternal credit, he responded that all of the children in the school were dirty, so he wasn't prepared to single the Aboriginal children out. These days, um, I suppose he would be called an ally and, and bless his memory. Of course, the link between access to education and employment is obvious, um, but in this instance, the location was in Kirsten's country where her family lived and she said that the reasoning of the community would be that by speaking, ex seeking expulsion for the black kids, it would get rid of her male relatives out of the community, off their own land, so they wouldn't take the fishing job. So there it is, the combination of what would now be called policies and practices that deliberately excluded First Nations people from the education and employment systems. There are so many stories like that of the smarts of survival on the margins of the economy of the modern Australia only recorded through memory and oral history. It has never suited the narrative of the coloniser to record these things in any meaningful way. The, the erasure of truth that the dominant, dominant narrative creates that we are still dealing with in workplace policy every day. 
So now, because of this exclusion, we need special measures and employment for Aboriginal people. One of the sources of the special treatment or benefits myths, the source of the, you only got this job because you're Aboriginal comments in workplaces. The low skill, low pay jobs that mob held on the railways, on the waterfront, in factories, in shops aren't recorded. The living as white outside the home to gain employment is not recorded. The leaving country to live in un unfamiliar cities where there was less racism isn't recorded. The lack of opportunities in country towns is recorded, but not the reason why. It's still said. Um, remember Tony Abbott and the lifestyle choices? The reason why people can't get employment in country town is, of course, straightforward. It's racism. The narrative around Indigenous people and employment in this modern Australia is as racist as it gets. Hopefully, the work of Indigenous archivists can begin to tell, tr tell truth and correct it. The work of truth-telling will be about ma massacres and poison water holes and stealing of children, ripping children away from their parents to breed the black out of them. Of a country where in Indigenous identity is contested because of the deeply cruel, cruel racist policies and, and way of life that still plays out and where the myth of bludging blacks has been created to suit the narrative, narrative. Where the records of surviving disadvantage simply don't exist because it didn't suit the purpose of electoral cycles. As I've always thought and indeed said, especially to my kids as we pulled in on holiday road trips, when I see as many obvious black faces serving in Kempsey McDonald's as I do white, I know it will have changed. All of us should be supporting the development of Indigenous archives practice and archivists as we move towards genuine truth telling from the horrific and tragic to the grinding and everyday. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Professor Noreen Young, for that really powerful uh, discussion of where truth telling really has to take us. Uh, not just the stories of massacres and frontier wars, but also into the lives of people living today. Thank you very much indeed for your contribution. Uh, and I'd like to, for the final speaker of this session, I'd like to introduce Danielle Lautrec. Uh, Danielle is a professional genealogist from Sydney. She previously worked for the Society of Australian Genealogists as Education Officer and Archives Officer, a wonderful place I've had something to do with recently, and I met Danielle. And uh, she's a policy advisor to the New South Wales State Government on Environment and Heritage Matters. Danielle has degrees in family history, history, archaeology and town planning, and has recently published her first book, The Good Genealogist, How to Improve the Quality of Your Family History. Over to you, Danielle. Uh, thank you, Rosalind, for inviting me to come and talk today and thank you everyone for uh, listening to what I hope will... Um, I feel a bit overwhelmed after following all those other presentations, but I hope you'll still enjoy my, my presentation as well. And as uh, Rosalind said, I'm talking about uh, family history. So I'm aware that some of you might not be familiar with family history, so I'm going to give you a very brief lesson on what that is. So family history is a branch of public history, which focuses on the investigation of the history of past and present members of a family or families. And anyone can research their family history from hobbyists with no tertiary education to professional historians. In the past, the practice used to focus primarily on lineage, but nowadays most genealogists incorporate the historical context. And some people use the terms genealogy for the former approach of lineage tracing and family history for the latter, more historical approach. However, that distinction is no longer applicable. I'm a professional genealogist and I research family history. And if your perception of family history is informed by television shows such as Who Do You Think You Are? or by the views of certain academic historians and psychologists, you may think that all genealogists are all about searching for their, their identity or identifying their relationship to the famous or to royalty. However, most family histories are full of ordinary people. In my own family history, I have blacksmiths, convicts, dressmakers, bone boilers, 
Thames watermen, shoemakers, and stocking knitters. Yes, I do have a few wealthy landowners and men involved in historic moments, but generally, family history is the history of the disadvantaged. The foundation of family history research is establishing identity and relationships. Who are the people in our family and how are they related to each other? Most genealogists tend to focus on biological relationships, but this is not always the case. Family histories can include adoptive families, foster families, step families, local communities, and groups of people who shared the same surname. There are no rules about who you include or who you exclude, provided they relate to your concept of family in some way. Because of this focus on identity and relationships, the most important sources used in family history are records of birth, death and marriage. These records identify people and their relationships to other family members. A birth certificate, for example, will usually name the father and mother. A death certificate will usually name the spouse and children of the marriage. DNA testing may also be used and the results of such tests may either confirm or refute these identities and relationships. As I found with my own family history, I discovered when I had my DNA tested that my father was adopted. We supplement birth, death and marriage records with other official records, such as these listed on the left here. These sources provide additional information about identity and relationships as well as other aspects of our ancestors' lives. These official records are held primarily in archives and libraries, and copies of some are held in genealogical collections, such as Ancestry or Family Search. We also use a wide range of non-official sources, such as family trees, family collections, and the family histories written by other genealogists. These types of sources are rarely held by archives or libraries. Instead, they're held by genealogical societies, some local libraries, and in private collections and online. I'd like to highlight some of the issues surrounding the preservation of records of the disadvantaged by talking to you about two women. And I chose to talk about two women because we all know that in many respects, the stories of women are underrepresented in the historical record. So I'm going to talk about Grace and Sophia. Grace Elizabeth Marsh was born in Jamaica in 1822. Her parents, Charlotte and Philip Pinnock, were of British descent. They were owners of the sugar plantation called New Shafton Pen in Westmoreland in the southwestern part of the island. Buildings from the plantation still exist as shown in the photograph on the right and are still used as a hotel. And if you know anything about Caribbean history, you'll know that that time period was when slavery was the main uh, employment force for such plantations. After her father's death in 1831, Grace moved to England with her mother Charlotte and siblings. The diary of Grace's brother George documents the arrival of the family at the home of their maternal grandmother, Anne Grant, in London Road, Gloucester. Also in residence were Charlotte's sister, Mary Ann, and her two children, Milburn and Fanny. Milburn was then home from his school in Cheltenham for the holidays. He would then have been about 14 years old and Grace was about 11 years old. This is Milburn on the left. Milburn went to Australia in 1840 with his aunt, Amelia Sophia, and her husband, Sir Francis Forbes, who some of you may recognise the name, Sir Francis Forbes was travelling to Australia to take up his appointment as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of New South Wales. Milburn refers to his engagement to Grace in this letter uh, to her in 1845. 
Shortly before their marriage in 1848, Milburn travelled from Australia to England where this portrait was taken. And this portrait is one of the oldest uh, daguerreotype photographs uh, in a collection in Australia. Not the oldest, one of. So he and Grace spent time going for long walks, visiting relatives and friends of the family, purchasing items for their marital home. Milburn was an avid diarist and documented their daily activities. Milburn was also an avid letter writer and over 100 of his letters to Grace have survived. These letters include sketches such as this one and this plan of the house that he was preparing for them in Australia. When they came to Australia, they settled on a property in the central west of New South Wales, near Yass, called Demondrill. Being a woman of means, the men of her family took it upon themselves to ensure that Grace and her family were protected upon her marriage, and an extensive indenture was prepared and executed. After their wedding, the pair boarded a ship for Australia. They were accompanied by their mother, sister and brother, as well as other members of the extended family and their social network. Their only child, George, was born during the voyage. We know of Grace's life in England and New South Wales, not just through the vast numbers of letters and journals, but also through her artwork. Grace was an accomplished artist and a collection of her sketches is held by the New South Wales State Library. These depict scenes such as this one of the region where they lived near Yass. Unfortunately, her work is, uh, however, not catalogued under her own name, but under the name of her husband, as was common at the time when these were added to the collection in the 1930s. Her paintings are not held by the State Library. However, fortunately, many survived and were donated to the Society of Australian Genealogists, along with vast quantities of family papers of both Grace and Milbourne's families. I love her artwork so much, I'll show you another slide. Uh, here are another examples of some of Grace's sketches. and some of her journals, autograph books, and her book of religious instruction, which was gifted to her by her aunt. Shortly before her death, Grace wrote a memoir of her life. Transcriptions in the memoir can be found on various websites online, but the original resides in the archives of the Society of Australian Genealogists. The original memoir of her brother, George Pinnock, also resides with the Society. Grace died in 1897 in Masterton, New Zealand. Her death notice appeared in the Sydney Morning Herald on the 29th of March. I've not yet been able to locate her burial place, so instead I've given you another picture that she uh, drew in one of her journals. Now, some of you may be thinking, we're supposed to be talking about the lives of the disadvantaged. Why are we talking about Grace? Mainly so that I can compare her to the next one, the next case study. So now we're gonna talk about the story of Sophia who led a very different life to Grace. And Sophia was my great-great-grandmother, that is my mother's father's father's mother, as I've shown by the diagram on the left. Sophia used about six or seven names during her lifetime, but she was known at her death as Sophia Jane Squires. No one has yet found a record of her birth, but it's likely that she was born Sophia Jane Shaw in 1841 in Maitland, New South Wales, to parents John and Lydia Shaw. As is often the case for ordinary people like Sophia, I have no photograph of her, so I use instead this photograph of her headstone. Sophia's parents were both convicts. John was a stocking weaver from Nottingham in England, 
was sentenced to seven years transportation to Australia. He died shortly after Sophia's birth in 1841. Her, mea, her mother, Lydia, was a dairy maid from Penzance in Cornwall, who was sentenced to seven years tr transportation to Australia for stealing a shirt worth three shillings. John and Lydia were married in 1832 and they had five children, of which Sophia was the last. After John's death, Lydia married another convict, Robert George Webb. Sophia was married in 1855, aged only 14, to an older man called John Squires. He was a, cult, a gold miner living near Mudgee in New South Wales. John and Sophia had two children. The second died at birth. Sophia ran away from her husband and child in 1857, just two years after the marriage, and the surviving child was adopted out and raised by another family and given a different name. And the truth of this story has been supported by DNA matches between descendants of this child and myself. Uh, Sophia then had another four or five children by a man called Peter Lennon, or Peter Lemon, uh, until he was sent to jail in 1866 for cattle stealing. And again, DNA matching has filled in some of the blanks in her story and DNA matching between descendants of the Lemon children and myself confirmed that uh, Sophia was their mother. And then we get to Sophia's third partner, uh, who was Samuel Hen, my great-great-grandfather. He was a Chinese shepherd, a billiard maker and a cook. Evidence of their relationship first appears in this article from the New South Wales Police Gazette of 18th of December, 1867, though her name is recorded as Jane White. Other records indicate that she lived on a property called Eden Glassy in Musselbrook, which was owned by the White family, and it's probably where she took that particular surname. Now, as I mentioned earlier before, she used six or seven different names during her lifetime. Sophia and Samuel had six children, bringing Sophia's total number of children to 12 or 13. Samuel and Sophia's first two children were born on the Tambarua, were born on the Tambarua goldfields near Hill End in New South Wales. The next were born on the goldfields at Spices Creek, which is located between Wellington and Galgong. Life on the goldfields was tough for anyone, but it must have been particularly challenging for a white woman partnered with a Chinese man and multiple children from different men. The New South Wales State Library has collections of photographs from gold mining areas of Western New South Wales during the period in which Sophia was living there. However, there are very few photographs of Chinese families. It's doubtful that their home would have been as luxurious as either of these two that you see here. The one on the left is a house from Hill End and the one on the right is a tent from Galgong, both on the gold fields. Apart from speculation about her life based on general historic records of the time period, the only other direct record that I found of Sophia was in 1874, when she was imprisoned in Bathurst Jail for one month for being unseemly rude. <laughs> Samuel died in 1889, and it appears that Sophia continued to live in the Wellington area at least until 1913. Sometime after that, she moved in with one of her daughters, also called Sophia, and lived with her in Gunnedah until she died in 1931. Family history helps to reconstruct the stories of the past, both the wealthy people like Grace and those whose lives were a constant struggle like Sophia. Unfortunately, people like Sophia leave very few records behind, which makes researching their stories 
extremely challenging. It's taken me over 15 years to construct that story that I told you today of Sophia's life. To preserve the stories of the past, we need to conserve not just the official records in libraries and government archives, but also the non-official records and stories such as I've shown you today. Because even for this amazing collection of original records that Grace and her family left behind, all family histories face the same challenge, and that is that very few institutions collect them. Very few institutions nowadays collect family history papers or family history research, and the burden rests with unfunded genealogical societies. So I wanted to leave you with that contrasting image. This is just a very small proportion of what Grace has left behind compared to Sophia. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle, for that very stark contrast in, in records between a wealthy woman. I must say I've had recent experience with the Harrison Papers at the Society and they are extraordinarily rich. The contrast between Sophia and Grace is, is extraordinarily telling and uh, I think it drives to what we're talking about here today. Um, I think, have we got time for questions now? A couple. Um, I might invite one from the room if uh, if there is one, and then we might go to online if possible. Any questions from our audience in the room? No, uh, Adrian. Do we have? Um, yeah. So there's um, there's one here um, from um, an anonymous uh, delegate. Um, so it was great to hear from Eva about the. Um, the moment she became a feminist. I wonder if any of our other speakers or guests have similar stories they'd like to share uh, about a moment that, uh, when they decided uh, to become someone who was uh, fighting not, not just for their own memories but for other people's access uh, in their memories too. So, um, so that's really um, an invitation for any of the speakers to um, to give similar examples if they would like to do so. Do we have any takers? Anyone here who has a story that's similar to the story that was told about, uh, from, by Eva Cox about how, how being denied the drum uh, made her a, a feminist activist? Uh, I... Yes, Louise. I, I said triangle in my head and I probably used to visualise it when you said that. So as a child in high school and wanting to be a part of the high school band, there was a saxophone on offer. Now I desperately wanted this I desperately wanted the saxophone. Blowing a lot of hot air, all of that. Um, however, it went to a boy. It went to a boy in my class. We were 13 years old, and I was given a violin instead. So um, I've always been a little frustrated that I didn't get that saxophone. Well, clearly the musical instrument deprivation is, is a story. <laughs> uh, any, any other instances of, um, of people changing their view at a very early age? Can I contribute my own story? Oh, sorry, Anne-Marie, please. Not my story at all, but a story that's going to appear in a forthcoming exhibition coming to you in a gallery space just near us in December is a story of a girl who wrote to Elizabeth Reid, first advisor to the Prime Minister, first women's advisor to a Prime Minister in Australia appointed in 1973, to complain about a yo-yo competition in her local area which um, awarded a television to the, to the boy and a wristwatch to a girl. Mm. Now, yes. I only need to say that and you, a whole landscape of discrimination, structural discrimination opens up. And Elizabeth Reid had invited these kind of um, contributions and she followed it up and got a number of letters from people complaining about this particular yo-yo competition and the inequity of the, of the prizes. And it goes to show how early these discriminations can begin and how they become ingrained in your own expectations of your world. Absolutely, anyone else have any contributions? I believe that Frank has, has yes. one to share with us. Yes, I do. Uh, you can hear me? 
Yes. Um, I remember very distinctly at school at the Ballarat Orphanage, um, which was a school on site. The children rarely went to schools outside uh, the orphanage. I remember it was in the days when children were kept back because they were dunces. Um, and I remember very clearly uh, routine punishments of children, vicious teachers cutting the children on the hand with the strap. And day after day and week after week and month after month and year after year, I puzzled about why the teachers would be so stupid as to keep hitting the kids because they're not learning. And it occurred to me that maybe it was the teachers who were not teaching well. And I just, um, I, I became a teacher. And uh, I must say, in all the time I was a teacher, the strap was never out of my drawer. Um, because you just, when you know that kids are struggling, what you don't do is hit them. Uh, and I saw it so often, uh, I think that was a turning point for me in my life and, and the way I looked at uh, human interaction. Thank you, Frank, for that contribution. Yes, I think many, many schoolboys of your era would have a very similar story. Um, mm. I know my husband has some of those from his, um, his Christian brother's upbringing. Uh, any more, Adrian? Um, well, I'll paraphrase one of the questions that has come in from our online attendees, but, but also sort of add part of my own spin onto it. And I, that is to say that <clears throat> I guess one of the starting assumptions of this Documenting Australian Society initiative is that the existing body of documentary holdings in, in Australia or indeed any country inevitably reflect the power structures of, of society, which in turn <coughs> privilege the stories and, and perspectives of the wealthy and powerful and marginalise or silence um, those who come from more disadvantaged backgrounds. And, and so we've heard a lot of direct personal testimony uh, today from, from uh, uh, people in that situation who um, are frustrated by the fact that um, the existing documentary record either silences them or distorts or presents a distorted uh, view of their particular experiences. Um, so I think that presents a challenge to all of us, um, you know, those who, who um, uh, those like Robin who, who interface on a daily basis with, with disadvantaged people, but also those of us who work in the, the documentary institutions as to um, what other mechanisms can we put in place to capture um, a less distorted view of, of these people's experiences? Uh, we heard the example of the National Library's oral history program that, that Joanna Sassoon worked on. Um, we've heard about the um, was it the Museum of Orph Orphanages that uh, that Frank mentioned. Um, but I guess I'd like to hear from some of the speakers about. For, in terms of their suggestions about what else, what else does Australia need to do to do a better job of capturing these stories? Can I say something? Yes. Hmm? No. Am I on air? Yes. All oh, right. yes, okay. yes, you are. Yes, yes. I please. mean, that was one of the questions I was going to ask is what sort of mechanisms do we have? What sort of processes do we have to actually have a look at what we have? and how accurate it is. Because obviously one of the problems is that you can donate a lot of stuff if you happen to have it. But looking at the looking for the gaps, but also looking for this, this stuff that has been donated that maybe could have a set of questions or comments attached to it to make it much more useful. But we need to sort of think about that process. And I'm just wondering whether you know, whether the UN itself is setting up ways and means of actually assessing how effective what is being stored is and how accurate it is so that one can actually maybe put a sort of stars or ticks or crosses on various things to say, this is really interesting, but it has left out a whole lot of things that maybe would be useful to understand the process. I mean, I know people just donate stuff, but it would be interesting to see if we 
can see if people want to create some flying squads or something like that that's going to go and look through some of the collections and find out what may be wrong and what may be missing so that when people go to look at the collections that they are more likely to get a sense of how well it's been done in the first place and maybe what other sorts of things should be looked at and what other things should be added to it. You know, do we have those sorts of criteria? Can I respond to that? Um, one of the things that the Memory of the World program has been uh, engaged in in recent years is uh, drawing up a set of gender equality baselines. This is on the gender equality side. Um, looking at existing inscriptions on Memory of the World register to against a set of, of um, baseline measures uh, and evaluating how well they meet them and suggesting ways in which we can interrogate documents to do exactly what you're talking about, Eva, to um, identify the gaps, to talk about how something could better express gender equality in this instance. Uh, so there are mechanisms that are being put in place. And one of the things that we're talking about in the um, 30th anniversary uh, is, is extending this and extending the kinds of thinking that you're talking about uh, across a global perspective as well as in Australia. So thank you for that. Um, I will certainly be sharing it. I'm going to Paris on next week to, uh, to participate in the symposium, and I'll definitely uh, take your insight with me. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Ros, uh, Robin also has um, something to contribute. Please. Um, hello, I hope you can hear me. Um, at, at a probably more micro level, um, one of the things that came out of this process for me, um, as I mentioned, that um, lots of times people that interact with our service, uh, we are obliged when requested by certain um, government departments or court to release people's files. And as they mentioned, often those files show a very limited view. It's very uh, what we call kind of problem saturated. So we're about to commence a project where we're going to offer people at the end of their time in our services um, the opportunity to sh actually share much more about who they are. And we will then um, attach that to their files. So it means that when a request is made to access their file, people um, or departments or courts are actually getting a much bigger picture of those people, not just the bits that, um, as you notice, people talked about being negative, but that they actually get a view of the whole person. That's a very encouraging um, development. I think that's, um, I think it's what we're talking about really today here. Um, I'm sure Adrian would agree. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yes, Danielle, please. So um, I was just thinking it, there's, there's two parts to the answer. One is about how do we improve what we're collecting, but then it's about how do we tell the stories of what we've collected and make sure that's more um, balanced as well. There's a lot of work being done with uh, by historians with collaborative history where the, the history making and the story making is not just done by the historians, but in collaboration with communities. So I think that on top of you know, the oral history stuff is, is the way forward with a lot of this material. Thank you very much for that. I think that's very, very much the, what we're talking about again today. Uh, I think we've probably finished this session. Uh, um, afternoon tea is available on, over, on the, over here on the side of the room. And, uh, I think we'll convene again in 10 minutes' time if possible. Thank you.